This is Unit 6, Thermochemistry, and um, I'd like you to take a few minutes, pause this video, and fill in the blanks that you see on your guided notes here, the underlined blanks. Go ahead and fill that out. And once you fill that out, leave it pause so that you can read this paragraph one time through and then a second time through and possibly a third time through so that you have an idea of what this whole unit encompasses. It is all about energy. So once you've read all the first paragraph, the introduction paragraph, you will now go ahead and take your, um, let's go ahead and actually calculate the um, total change in enthalpy. And how we do that is, or the reason why we do that is because we're looking at the stored energy that's inside the chemical bonds in our chemical reactions. And so we're going to calculate all that stored energy and figure out what the total amount of energy will be that will be garnered from that reaction or absorbed by that reaction. So it might be released or absorbed in the end. And how we're going to do that is we're going to take the difference in the bonds broken in the reactants and, of course, the bonds formed in the products. And the values that we're going to use are from this table called the Table of Average Bond Energy. It's in kilojoules per mole. How do you read this table? Well, it's separated by single bonds and multiple bonds. The single bonds are just that. These are all different single bonds between two different atoms. In the first one, it's a carbon-hydrogen bond. The amount of energy involved in absorbing or releasing when I... Um, uh, for between these two atoms, carbon and hydrogen, is 413 kilojoules per mole. Then down below, this is a double bond. It's hard to see, but just use it reference-wise. This is a carbon-carbon double bond, and it's 614 kilojoules per mole. It makes sense that a double bond would have more energy, 614, than, say, a single bond. Um, usually best to compare it between the two same two elements, carbon-carbon. So 348 kilojoules per mole versus 614 kilojoules per mole. So the first step that we have to do as we begin this first example problem is to balance this equation. So as we usually balance equations, we always start off with our least frequent elements. Carbon is our least frequent Carbon and hydrogen are least frequent, so I'm going to start off with carbon. There's two carbons here on the left-hand side in C2H4, and there's only one here, so I'm going to put a 2 in front here. Going to the hydrogens, there are four hydrogens on the left side, on the reactant side, so I need a 2 here. Now I'm going to add up all the oxygens. There's four oxygens, 2 times 2 is 4, plus another 2 here gives us 6. So there's six oxygens. So I'm going to need a number that represents, makes this oxygen six. So it's going to be three. So this is a one coefficient. So these are all the amount of moles of each of the gas particles, or each of the particles inside this reaction. There's one mole of C2H4, three moles of O2, two moles of CO2, and two moles of H2O. And, of course, now we're on to our next step. In our next step, you're going to have to flip back to the average bond energy table to be able to figure out the, the types of bonds and the energy that's involved in each of those types of bonds. Now we're on to step two. In step two, we are asked to draw the Lewis structures for each of the substances in the chemical reaction. And why we do that, why we do this step, is to see which atoms are bonding and how many bonds are between them, and also to account how many moles of each substance we have for in that chemical reaction. So let's go ahead and begin drawing Lewis structures. Now you'll have to have your periodic table out so that you, we can go ahead and um, start figuring out the number of valence electrons that are involved in each of the atoms as we bond them. So the first substance is recalling C2H4. 
So C2H4 has two carbons. Each carbon, if you look on the periodic table, has four valence electrons. Now, I have four hydrogens, and what I'd like to do with the hydrogens in, is to put them symmetrically on evenly between the and, and, and divide them evenly between the two um, carbons. So again, hydrogen has one valence electron according to the periodic table. Now I'm ready to bond them. My first thing to do is to do a single bond. After I do a single bond, I notice that this carbon doesn't quite have an octet yet. So I count two, four, six, and only seven. There's only seven electrons, including the shared ones between the carbons and the hydrogens. And so I need eight, according to the octet rule. Likewise, this carbon also has only seven, so I need eight. And it looks like I'm going to have to engage in a multiple bond. So now I do the same thing, but I'm going to do it faster with the oxygen. So there are three moles of oxygen. I'm going to do it three times, which means I'm going to squeeze in just a little bit up here so that I can show four, or three of them. So oxygen tends to have six valence electrons. The other oxygen also has six valence electrons. I do my single bond. And then it looks like I need a double bond between the two oxygens. And then I'm going to do it again. But in, in doing it again, I'm going to take some shortcuts. A lone pair can be represented by a line. So I'm going to represent the lone pairs by that line. And then I'm going to do it again a third time. So this is my three moles of O2. Now I go over to the product side. On the product side is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, ha carbon has four valence electrons. Oxygen has six valence electrons. And then I draw my single bond, and then I realize there's another bond and another bond here so that I can fulfill my octet rule. And once again, I take my when I draw my second one, I take my shortcut of knowing that there's only two lone pairs around that oxygen as there is only two lone pairs around this oxygen. And I'm going to draw my two water molecules on the other side here. And once again, taking my shortcut, I see two lone pairs on the oxygen. So I have all the bonds, uh, bonding that's taking place within the molecules, as well as however many particles there are in the reaction. So my next step is to go on to my, um, my average bond table, which is on the first page, and I start writing my average bond numbers in my reaction in the Lewis structures of my reaction. In other words, here I see a double carbon-carbon bond. And this carbon-carbon bond takes four, 614 kilojoules per mole to break. And I found that on the table, the table of bond energy on page one. For a carbon-hydrogen bond, it takes 413 kilojoules per mole. For a double bond, it will take 495 kilojoules per mole. And then for my carbon, uh, carbon oxygen double bond, reading it off the table, takes 799 kilojoules per mole. For a carbon or an oxygen hydrogen bond, it is 463 kilojoules per mole. Now, I have at least one or the bond energy, the average bond energy for each of those different types of bonds that are that I see in each of the molecules. The next thing to do is to count how many I have and then do multipliers of it. So in other words, 
if I look right here, I have one carbon-hydrogen bond right here. I have another one right here and a, sec a third one and a fourth one. So there's four of them. And because there's four of them, I'm going to multiply this carbon-hydrogen and the amount of energy, which is 413, by four. And I would do that for each one. Now, for the carbon-carbon double bond, there's only one of them, so I really don't need to multiply by one, but I'm showing you that there's only one of them there by multiplying it by one. So, so now let, I look at the carbon or the double bonded oxygen. So I have one double bonded oxygen here. I have another one right here, and then I have another one right here. So there's a total of three times that amount. So I'm going to multiply 495 kilojoules per mole times three. Now I also do it for my products. I see a carbon oxygen double bond right here. It takes 799 kilojoules per mole to break this bond. And I have how many of them? I have one, two, three, four. So I'm going to do a multiplier of four for this. And so on and so forth. I have four oxygen hydrogen bonds, so I'm going to multiply that by four. So I have all my multiplied values, and so I'm going to do my reactants. I'm going to add up all the reactants after I multiply them. And then, of course, I'm going to add up all the products after I multiply what I, what I need of each of those. So I'm going to take 400 from the top. I'm going to take 413 times 4 plus 614 times 1 and that is my one of my reactants and then I'm also going to add 495 times 3 and again that is the sum of my bond energy of my reactants and then I would do the same thing for my products 799 times it by 4 plus 463 times it by 4. And that will be the bond energies of my products. Now because I have everything lined up, now I can use this equation that I see down below to be able to subtract and get my enthalpy, my total change in enthalpy of the reaction. So I take my bonds of my reactants right here, that total, and I subtract it from the bond energy of my products. And upon adding, I discovered that the bond energy of my reactants, when I'm adding all of these numbers up, I get a total of 3,751 kilojoules per mole. Likewise, for the or similarly with the products, I get 5,048 kilojoules per mole. So all I'm going to do is subtract those two numbers, 3,751 minus 5,048. I then get a number of negative 1,297 kilojoules per mole for my enthalpy. So this is my final enthalpy value. So the question is, will this reaction, once we have the total enthalpy, we want to know if this reaction is endothermic or exothermic. Now because the value, the enthalpy, is a negative value, so because it's a negative value, we, we know that this reaction is exothermic. So the graph that best represents that is, in fact, this graph right here that we have on the left side. So this is our graph. And if you read it carefully, and you've always known combustion reactions are exothermic reactions. If you read it carefully, it says right here that delta H is a negative value, means more energy is released than the reactants um, when the reactants become products in the chemical reaction. So here's my reactants, whatever my reactants for the reaction is. In this case, it's C2H4 and 
O2 molecules. It, to, for it to become products, which is CO2 and H2O, I am going to release energy. Notice that the potential energy is lower for the products than the reactants. And upon releasing that energy, that release energy is in the amount of 1,297 kilojoules per mole. So that ends this page. Let's go ahead and look at the next page. So in step six, we're going to model to show how heat is exchanged between the system and the surrounding. Now you look at the system as the actual reaction. The surrounding is you and I around the reaction or the air surrounding it or anything around the system. So let's go ahead and see. Let's lay out where things are in this model. So our system is actually the chemical reaction. So C2 H4 plus 3O2 forming two CO2s and two H2O. So this is actually the reaction. Now what is the surrounding? The surrounding would be you and I, um, the air, the atmospheric air surrounding that. So it's everything that is around your system. So anything beyond your system. So let's go ahead and represent how heat is exchanged. Because heat is going to evolve from this reaction, you're going to see the heat, as we've always said earlier in the first paragraph, that heat always goes from warmer to cooler. Because this reaction is warmer, you're going to see heat move from the system to the surrounding. And heat is represented by that triangle that you see. Again, because this reaction is exothermic, heat is going from your system to your surrounding. Because your system is where it's warm, this is where it's warm, your surrounding is where it's cooler. So it's, heat is always going to go from warmer to cooler, as you see here. So let's go ahead and look at the energy. Let's revisit the energy diagram again. So this is the energy diagram. And in the energy diagram, you are to look at, um, we always start off with reactants. Um, sorry, first your x and y axis. Your y axis is going to always be the potential energy. Your x axis is always going to be time or the, the progress of a reaction. Um, so that's what you're seeing in both of these diagrams, whether it's the endothermic or the exothermic scenario. From the reactants to the top of this hill, you're actually rearranging the bonds in the reactants to make what is called the activated complex. Upon making the activated complex, the rearrangement of those atoms start to occur to then form the products in the end. The energy to get to the activated complex is called the activation energy. So this span right here, this difference in potential energy is called the activation energy. The difference between the products and the reactants is enthalpy, which is your delta H. And you'll notice that when you take the products minus the reactants, you'll see a negative value coming out of this because products are lower in potential energy reactants are higher, when you take a lower number minus a higher number, you're going to see a negative value come out of this. And that's how you actually compute the enthalpy directly from the energy diagram graph. The same thing here, but unlike the exothermic scenario, you'll notice that the product's potential energy is higher than the reactant's potential energy. So when you subtract those two values, you'll get a positive potential or enthalpy. And then also the activation energy is quite high up here. From the reactants to the activated complex, you'll notice a very long stretch compared to an exothermic reaction. And that's why endothermic reactions don't occur very often compared to exothermic. There are more exothermic reactions in nature because Exothermic reactions release heat, and reactions much more um, favorable in nature are ones that release, give us heat, 
give us energy rather than um, absorb energy. So let's go ahead and go down here where we will look at the different um, or an example problem, okay? Let's start off. Um, it says right here that we are going to find the potential energy values of our um, reactants, our transition state, and our product. Now transition state is another way of saying um, our activated complex. So I'm going to write it up here. This is also called a transition state. Activated complex is also called our transition state. So let's go ahead and fill out our value, our chart. So the reactant is right here. This is your reactants. A and B are your reactants. So what's the potential energy of your react reactants? If you said 40, you are correct. It's 40 kilojoules per mole. So let's go ahead and write that in. 40 kilojoules or kilojoules. We're going to write exactly what the, the units are labeled. Now the transition state is up here. So this is where your activated complex is or your transition state. Now that activated complex has an energy, potential energy of 100 kilojoules. And then our products, which is C and D, this is a generic product, is 20 kilojoules. It says, number two, calculate the activation energy for the forward reaction. So I'm going to highlight this, okay? Now, as I highlight this, you're going to notice that the activation energy is actually from the reactants to activated complex. So it's this distance that you see right here. From the reactants to the activated complex. And we're really looking at the forward direction. And what I mean by forward is we're going from the reactants to the products. The reverse is when you're going from the products to the reactants. And so the activated complex for that, from the products to the activated complex, is right here. So they're different. One is reactants to products, and then the other one is products to reactants. And so we call this E of A forward. So it's in the forward direction. Whereas this here is E of A, activation energy, reverse. So it's going in the reverse direction. So to calculate that is to measure. Um, the reactant's potential energy is 40. The activated complex at potential energy is 100. So what is that difference between 40 to 100? And you're correct if you said 60. So the activated complex is 60 kilojoules. Likewise, from when we try to find the activation energy for the reverse, the potential energy of the product is 20, the activated complex is 100, so what is that difference in potential energy? So, so then your measurement is, difference in measurement is 80 kilojoules per mole. Now we're ready to calculate the enthalpy. To calculate the enthalpy is to measure the difference in the energy of the products and the reactants. And so that is your delta H of your reaction. To, to get that is to just find the difference in that. And so the difference between the products minus the reactants is 20 minus 40. So I'm going to show that work here over the side. So 20 minus 40 is in fact negative 20. So this is negative 20 kilojoules. 
Now, it asks if the reaction is endothermic or exothermic. So we know earlier that since the delta H is negative, the reaction is exothermic. Now, what would you imagine the enthalpy for the reverse reaction would be? So now, if we're reversing this reaction, your values are all going to be flipped in reverse. So it's 40 minus 20, and that is positive 20 kilojoules. And so the type of reaction going the reverse direction is endothermic. And the last step is to show what a catalyst does. And I'm going to show it on the graph. What a catalyst does is it speeds up a reaction. And how it speeds up a reaction is it lowers the activation energy. So this is the movement of a catalyst right here. It lowers the activation energy. So I'm going to show a catalyst by the lowering of the activation energy for the forward and the reverse. So, and that ends it. If I pose the question of which burns longer, a piece of coal or a piece of wood, both of the same size and the same mass, what would you say? And I'd like you to pause so you can uh, answer this question and explain it. Well, I hope you say coal. And you can see, and that's why we use coal as a form of fuel. So coal burns longer than wood, or burns longer than wood because it has stronger bonds. And if you remember, coal is carbon. And carbon, if you look at the type of bond type it has, Carbon is bonded through what is called covalent network. And if you recall from last semester, covalent network has one of the strongest bonds as opposed to wood, which is actually bonded through um, intermolecular forces. So it's covalent also, but it has, wood has, um, just covalent bonds rather than covalent network. And we know covalent network is definitely stronger and tighter bonds than covalent bonds, which have intermolecular forces. And that's why coal would have, would burn longer in the end. So let's go ahead and look at the difference between heat and temperature. Heat is actually not an actual thing. It's a process. It's a process of flowing, energy flowing from, kinetic energy flowing from a warmer object to a cooler object. And um, while temperature is basically the average kinetic energy. So it's, the en it's actually an entity. It's a measurement of the kinetic energy of the particles inside a substance. So if we look at this diagram right here, we'll notice that we have a Bunsen burner right here, and this Bunsen burner is on this side, heating up these particles on, on the right side. Here we have a, a, a um, conductive layer here, and so we're going to see how heat is going to transfer. So logically, we, we'll, we would expect this side to be warming up as that Bunsen burner is heating that side. So it's going to be warmer. On the left side, we would expect those particles to be cooler. So logically, warmer objects will, or that heat, the kinetic energy on the right side from the, warm, from the warming of these particles will transfer over, over to the cooler side. So heat always flows from warmer to cooler. So this is heat flowing. And so please describe that in written words over here. How the heat, how heat is flowing and how temperature has much, temperature difference is, has much to do with why that heat is flowing between the warmer to the cooler object. So what's heat? We go down here to describe heat as energy in the process of flowing from a warmer to a cooler object. 
we can actually measure heat. Heat is measured using units of units like calories. So what is a calorie? A calorie is the energy or heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of a pure substance by one degree Celsius. Some other units for calories are big C calories, which is your nutritional. This is your nutritional calorie. And then there's also joules. There's also kilojoules and kilo cal as well. So there's also variations of your, your base units of energy. So let's go ahead and convert. Now I have your converters right here. You always will be given these converters. So please make sure you know that they're here as well as behind your periodic table when you need it. So let's go ahead and calculate your convert, or let's go ahead and convert your units between calories or joules. So if I have 25 cal calories, small c calories, and I want to convert it to joules, I'm going to use dimensional analysis to do the conversion. Calories go on the bottom to cross cancel, joules go on the top to try to achieve that goal, to, to try to achieve that unit. 4.184 joules for every one calorie as stated right here in this conversion right here. And so let's go ahead and do the math. Calories cancels out, leaving us with joules, and I get 105 joules. So my answers are always given to you in red, okay? So go ahead and pause and work through the next conversion using these converters that are given to you. I am going to continue. So let's go ahead and look at the next one. In the next one, we're taking point zero one one big C calorie, and we're trying to convert it to joules. Now, the difference between big C calorie and small C calorie is given to us right here. It says that one big C calorie is a thousand small C calorie. It's, so it's basically a big C calorie is a kilocal. So working out my dimensions, I want to cross cancel big C calorie and I want to get to small C calorie. And then I want to take my small C calorie and convert it to joules. So this is my mapping of my units. And there's a thousand big small C calorie in one big C calorie. There's 4.184 joules in one calorie. And so if you calculate this all, you should get 46 joules as your final answer. In the third problem, pause to try to do the third problem before we work through this. I'll go ahead and continue to work through this. Here I have 4.6 kcal and I want to convert it to small c calorie or just calories. So I know that in I want to cancel out my kcal and there's a thousand small c calories in one kilocal. So then I multiply it out and I get 4,500 small c calories. Now, it says how many calories are released and it's exothermic. So this is energy that is being released. Continuing on with the conversions. I'm going to take 256 kilojoules and I'm going to convert it to calories. So the first thing I want to do is convert it to joules. So I know that one kilojoule has a thousand joules and from the joules I would like to convert it to calories. So I know that there's 4.184 joules in one calorie. So notice the cross canceling of my units leading me to my final answer in the end. 61,200 small c calories. Now it says right here, is this reaction endothermic or exothermic? There are some hint words. The, the word absorbed means that it must be endothermic. So there's that one hint word that says, hey, this reaction must be endothermic thermic.
So what is specific heat? So to calculate heat, we need some components. One of the components is the change in temperature so that we can see how heat is flowing. So the temperature change, basically. Another thing we need is to know is the material and what the material's capability of absorbing heat is. And so we call that the heat capacity. The heat capacity is that material's ability to absorb heat. And every material is different. And that's why you see on this side, this table right here, the heat capacity of different substances. Gold's heat capacity is 0.129. That means it doesn't need a lot of heat before it starts changing temperature. That's why if you put silver, gold, and lead, and iron, all of these different types of metals out in the heat, they will change temperature quite rapidly because they don't need a lot of energy before their temperature changes by one degree Celsius. So let's go ahead and make sure we define heat capacity before we actually discuss this chart. Heat capacity, or specific heat capacity, um, specific heat is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. So if you look at this, Gold, silver, lead, and iron all have low heat capacity, which means they don't require a lot of energy in order to raise one gram of that, the, each of these substances by one degree Celsius. Whereas water actually has one of the highest. Now liquid water, that is, because it's between zero and 100. We're talking about liquid water. Ice has a different, water in the solid form, which is ice, has a different capacity. Steam also has a different or specific heat capacity. So these are all different values that often will be given to you or you might even solve yourself sometimes in a problem. So it says right here, an example conceptual, and a conceptual example is one of the reasons beachfront property is so expensive is due to the stable ambient temperatures along the coast. Explain why temperatures do not fluctuate significantly through the day using the specific heat, specific heat of water. Well, of course, we like living in the beach because not only is the view amazing, but we also have lots of humidity. And that humidity is in the air. There's a lot of moisture in the air. And so that water in the air really allows or absorbs during the daytime when it's really hot. And so that heat from the sun gets, uh, the water molecules are absorbing all that heat during the daytime. But then at nighttime, all that stored heat in the water is actually released because the cooler air temperature, uh, the air temperature is cooler and of course the droplets of water molecules are warmer so heat is going to flow from the droplets of water molecules in the air into, uh, back into the air. So that allows temperature to really stay pretty constant. Whereas in the desert, you won't see, or you don't have humidity, you don't have much humidity to be able to store that heat from the sun in the daytime to release it during the nighttime. We're gonna begin calculating um, but before we do that, let's just do a quick reminder. Exothermic is when heat is released. Your Q, which you're about to be introduced to, is going to be negative, and your enthalpy is going to be negative as well. Endothermic is when heat is absorbed, Q is positive, and your delta H, your enthalpy, is going to be positive as well. So let's go ahead and introduce how we measure heat. Heat is measured using this equation. I like calling this equation the MCAT because it looks like MCAT. So to map out this equation, Q is your heat variable, M is your mass of your substance, C is the specific heat of that substance, and then of course the change in temperature of that substance. So it maps out all the pot, what they all mean, each of these variables, as well as what units you should expect from each of the variables. Heat is oftentimes in joules, calories, kilojoules. Mass is in grams. Specific heat is oftentimes the same unit that you saw up here, which is joules per gram times degree Celsius. And of course, the specific heat can also be in calories as well, depending on the scenario.
The change in temperature is really T final minus T initial, and it's in degrees Celsius. Unlike gases where we work in Kelvin, in, when it comes to thermo, we work thermochemistry, we work in degrees Celsius. Let's look at this first example problem. It says how much energy, so I'm looking for Q, is required to raise the temperature of, and they give you a certain mass, of aluminum from 3 degrees Celsius to 13 degrees Celsius. So here's your change in temperature. And of course they give you your specific heat capacity or your specific heat capacity or your specific heat of aluminum. So you just substitute it into this equation. Q equals M cat. Starting off with Q equals, it's our unknown, your mass, which is 50 grams, times it by the specific heat capacity. and the change in temperature. And the change in temperature is really the subtraction between T final minus T initial and so all you have to do is do the math from there. So this is really 10 degrees Celsius, that difference. And so if you look at the units alone you'll see some cross-canceling occurring here. Grams cross-cancels degrees Celsius cross cancels, leaving us with joules as our final unit. So going ha when you punch these or put these numbers into your calculator and multiply them, you will get 4,500 joules. Now, the question is asking us in kilojoules. So go back to the question, you'll notice that it wants energy in kilojoules. So you're going to have to do a conversion whether you move the decimal over to the left three spaces or you actually just use dimensional analysis and you know that 1,000 joules is in one kilojoule oops um, so then you multiply or divide it out and you get as of a result of dividing by a thousand you get 0 0.450 kilojoules and so there is our answer in the end after watching me do the first example problem, I'd like you to try the next two problems, example two and three, on page six. Okay, so once you've worked it out, you should go through the problem and you see all your variables lined up for you. Starting off with mass, your temperature change, your Q, and then you just have to find what is called the specific heat. Now the specific heat is your C, so we're looking for our specific heat capacity. And then you're identifying the substance using the table from the specific heat table that you see on the prior previous page. So you put your numbers in. Now Q has to be in joules because your specific heat values are all in joule, joules per per gram times degrees Celsius. So you have to convert 4.2 kilojoules into joules. Now you can either use move the decimal over to, to the right three spaces or you can use dimensional analysis. I'm going to show you dimensional analysis to show you the harder step to do to do your conversion. So it looks like it's 4,200 joules. So our Q is in place. So 4,200 joules is our Q. Now our M, which is 10 grams, and then our specific heat capacity is our unknown, and our change in temperature is 0 degrees Celsius minus 100 degrees Celsius. Now when you subtract that, you'll notice something. Because this problem says release, you know that your Q is whatever your Q is, is going to be the negative. So when you bring that negative over to this side, when you bring it over to this side, you'll notice that this temperature change, although it's negative, will be now positive as a result. In other words, I'm just going to show you that work.
This is negative 100 degrees Celsius. So when you take and bring that negative over, and how you bring a negative over is you just multiply by negative 1 to both sides. So multiplying by negative 1 to both sides, you'll notice that this becomes a, po or the left side is all now positive, and then a negative and a negative is positive. In other words, everything ends up being a positive value in the end. So when you solve for your specific heat capacity, your C, multiply and divide, you will get 4.2 joules per gram times times degrees Celsius. And then to figure out what substance this is, you go back to the previous chart or previous page and you look at the table of specific heat capacity and you'll notice that it is liquid water. Going on to number three now. Here's my mass. Here's my, my first temperature, but I need a final temperature. So it says it's cooling down and then it releases Q. So this is my heat in calories. And so it's asking for my TF, which is my final temperature. So to set this up, it gives us a specific heat. And I'll notice the units. The specific heat is in calories. So I really can leave Q in calories here. So setting up the problem, I start off with my Q, which is 300 calories. And then I set up my mass, which is 50.0 grams. And then moving on to my specific heat capacity, which is 1.00 cal per gram times degree Celsius. And then the temperature change. Now, because you've cooled, so it's at 60 and then it cooled, that means that the temperature is going to go down. Because the temperature is going to go down, your T final is your TF minus your 60 degrees Celsius here. Now, because water, the object, has cooled, which means it's releasing heat, that means that it's releasing uh, the reaction or the system is releasing heat to the surrounding. And that means the reaction is, in fact, exothermic. So I'm going to add a negative for the Q, because that's what exothermic means. And so you're going to have to do your math with that negative in mind. Now, there are a couple options. One of the options I like to do is bring the negative over to the right-hand side. And upon doing that, what happens is this variable, upon putting the negative, bringing the negative over to this side, especially for this term, what happens is this variable gets flipped. That's what that negative does. It flips every all the vari that variable. And so no longer is that negative on the left-hand side. It's now used to flip that term. And um, so continuing on with the calculation, you just multiply it out. You're going to have to use some distributive property. So this is 300. I'm just going to look at the numbers only so it'd be easier for you to see the math. So this is 50 only. Once you take 1 times it by 50 grams, you'll get 50. And then of course from here on out it's just 60 minus, and I'm going to even make it easy for you by saying x. So you can just do this math problem like you would normally do. So making this math problem work for yourself um, X ends up being 54 degrees Celsius. Now, some of you are like, Mrs. No, I don't want to bring that negative over to this side and flip the term. You don't have to. You can just leave the negative there and just do the calculations, but be very careful as you're going through your calculation in terms of your algebra skills. So now let's go ahead and talk about the heating and cooling curve. And we're going to fill out the chart below to describe this heating and cooling curve, okay? Um, so 
we can actually take all the Q calculations from above and make what is called a cooling heating curve. Our class is not doing that, but we're going to look to see how to read this cooling and heating curve um, with that information. So Q is usually down here. This is where Q is represented. And then temperature is your y or uh, your y axis. So accordingly, this is usually um, representing a pure substance. So this graph actually represents like water, or carbon dioxide, or gold, or any pure substance. It's not usually a mixture of different substances. So it's not including any kind of solution. So this here actually represents water. And some of the information that you will know from this is when you're below a certain temperature, in this case, when you're below zero degrees Celsius, so this is reading zero degrees Celsius right here. This here is reading 100 degrees Celsius. So when you have a scenario like this, what you're looking at is water below zero degrees Celsius is in fact a solid. So it's uh, ice. And so then it goes through this point where changes are occurring. And those changes are where you're breaking up the intermolecular forces um, that are between water, hydrogen bonding specifically, in order to get it to become a liquid. So there's a phase change. And so during this phase change is when there's an equilibrium between the solid and the liquid. And during that time, um, when we go one direction on the phase change, which is you're going from solid to liquid, we call that melting. When we go from liquid to back to solid, the reverse, it's called freezing. Now, all of this to be said, this whole phase change is actually often call, called fusion, usually melting. Okay, so then after water becomes, uh, goes through the phase change, it then gets, as more heat gets added, what happens is that water is um, going to fully liquefy, so it becomes a liquid. And then once that happens, you hit a temperature point in which those particles are going to go through a phase change again. And in this phase change, you're looking at a liquid becoming a gas, which is vaporization. And then the reverse, which is called condensation. And moving forward, you then get into the gas phase. Once you overcome all the intermolecular forces, you're breaking up those bonds, and so and you're breaking up those intermolecular forces, and so you become fully a gas afterwards. So this is the cooling or heating curve for water. And if we go reverse, it's actually called the cooling curve. So the forward is the heating curve, and then the reverse is the cooling curve. Now, let's talk about potential energy. Because potential energy is um, m measuring stored energy, we're really talking about any kind of bond breaking that's occurring. So bond breaking occurs during phase changes. Bond breaking is occurring during phase changes here. But when you're heating an object and warming an object up, like you see along here, all you're doing is changing the kinetic energy. So you're increasing the kinetic energy, you're increasing kinetic energy, you're increasing that kinetic energy. Now, recall that kinetic energy is actually a measurement of temperature. Temperature is the measurement of average kinetic energy. As you increase in temperature, you're actually increasing the kinetic energy. Likewise here, and then likewise here. Now notice when a phase change occurs, your temperature stays constant. And that's because all of that energy, that heat energy that's being added along that span of time, that span is in fact really converted to potential energy in order to try to break up those intermolecular forces or recombine those or remake those bonds because you're, if you're cooling.
So you're breaking it up when you're heating and then when you're cooling, you're making those bonds again. So, but all of these increases that you're seeing is really along the heating curve, okay? So to answer these questions below here, which line segment AF um, shows an increase in kinetic energy? Obviously, this graph really shows you where the kinetic energy increase is. It's along AB, along um, CD, and then along EF, okay? Segments that show for potential energy changes are the following. It goes from BC, and then also DE. So along these flattened points where temperature doesn't change is when you see phase changes, which is where potential energy changes are occurring, meaning that's when bond breaking is occurring and bond forming is occurring. Okay. So you are to fill out the bottom half of this chart which describes what's happening on the heat curve along different parts of the segments that you see on your in your guided notes. So pause as, as you need in order to do that. Okay, so we're going to finish up with the questions as well. It says identify where melting starts and stops. And so when you go ahead and look at your um, phase or your um, heat curve, you can see that melting starts at B and then it stops at C. It freezes, which means you're going the reverse, at starts to freeze at C and then it stops freezing at B. So it's it's the cooling. So this is the cooling curve. Whereas this is the heating curve. Where does vaporization start? Vaporization begins at letter D. And where does condensation end? Well, it ends at the same spot that vaporization begins, which is D. So it's a little tricky question. Where vaporization starts is where condensation ends. Which line segment shows the greatest change in heat? And the line segment that you see the greatest change in heat is the one that has the largest span on the x-axis as far as the heat curve. And if you notice, the largest span occurs along DE. And that, which line segment has the greatest temperature change? It looks like the line segment of CD, which is the liquid phase. Okay, so now we get into our heat, calculating heat with a phase change. So we learned how to calculate the heat when things are being heated up, but no phase change is occurring. But now we're going to calculate heat with a phase change. The equation here are the, there's two of them. You can either use one or the other depending on the scenario. One is in, the, the mass is in one and then what differentiates the other one is the moles is in the second one. So mass versus moles. And so that's why M is your mass and then N is your moles. Q is our typical heat and all the variables that represents heat. And then depending on whether you're dealing with freezing, melting, or fusing, which is a phase, a certain phase change, the heat involved, the heat content is going to be different from the other phase change, which is boiling or condensing or vaporizing. So this is the value for um, vaporization, which is, it's called the change in enthalpy of vaporization. First is this value is for the change in enthalpy of fusion or the latent heat of fusion. Be aware that you, there's two values. One is in joules per gram, the other one is in cal per gram. So you can use one, or, uh, depending on the, um, depending on what you're asked to find, you can use one unit or the other. We're on to page six now. We are going to calculate the heat in 
melting something, freezing something, vaporizing, vaporizing something, or condensing something. So it's during the phase changes that we're going to calculate the heat. So let's go ahead and figure out what part of the segment you're looking at when we're calculating as we're looking at this problem. It says right here, calculate the amount of heat in joules required to freeze 100 grams of water. Now the word freeze means we're going through a phase change. And so we're going to use an equation that involves phase change. So the equation we're going to use is Q equals M times, and mass, not moles, because ma if you look at the mass of water, it's in grams, so we want to keep it in, or we want to use the mass rather than the moles. Your delta H is going to be the delta H of fusion, because we're looking at freezing. Fusion means freezing, or melting, or freezing. So the segment we're really calculating is this segment right here on the heat curve. The segment right here, which is segment BC. So the segment that we're calculating is BC. To calculate is just to use the, this equation and simply substitute all our variables in. Starting off with the mass. The mass is 100 grams. The delta H of fusion from the previous page is given to you as eight or as three hundred. You could use eighty, but you really want it in joules, so we're going to choose to use three hundred and thirty-four joules per gram. Notice the grams cancels out, and you're left with three thirty-three thousand four hundred joules. So let's go to the next problem. These problems are pretty easy. So the next problem, we see the word vaporize. And you're calculating the heat in calories, now calories rather than joules, of 120 grams of liquid water. So the part of the phase diagram, or the heat curve that you're using, is this part right here, DE, so segment DE. The equation you're going to use is a different equation with a different, or it's the same equation, but the delta H of vaporization. So Q equals M times delta H of vape, vaporization. And the segment that you're looking at is DE. So let's go ahead and calculate that. Q equals mass, which is 120 grams, times your delta H of vaporization. And the delta H of vaporization is chosen as, I'm going to choose 540 calorie per gram, and I've chosen calories rather than the 2,260 joules per gram because I want my units in calories. So grams cancels out, leaving us with our answer 64,800 calories. Let's go to the next problem. I would pause to do these problems yourself before you look and see how I do it. So now in the next problem, you're looking at fusion, molar heat of fusion. And you're asked to calculate the molar heat of fusion, which is delta H. So you're using Q equals N times delta H of fusion. So you're really trying to solve for delta H of fusion. The segment we're looking at is BC. So let's go ahead and calculate the delta H of fusion. So I'm going to re reorganize that equation. And to calculate the delta H of fusion is to take the Q and divide by the N. And to do that is to just take your Q that's given to us, and you're given 30,000, this is your Q right here, but you want it in kilojoules. You want to match your units. This unit is in joules, you want it in kilojoules. So I'm going to move the decimal place over three spaces and I get this in kilojoules. Now I need my N. My N is in mole, my moles. So I need my grams of ice, which is water, in moles. And so I'm going to do a really quick conversion from grams of ice, which is water,
into moles. And I know that there's 18.02 grams of water in one mole of ice, in one mole of water. And in dividing these two numbers, and you should get your calculator out to do so, this equals 5.00 moles of water. Again, cross-canceling the units. So I'm going to plug it under, underneath where it says 5 moles, and then I will get my molar heat of fusion, which is 6.02 kilojoules per mole. Okay, let's discuss heat flow now. Heat flow will always go from the warmer object to the cooler object. Therefore, the warmer object will oftentimes lose heat while the cool object will gain heat. And so this heat statement is what we're going to really focus on as we go through our understanding. So it's always the heat loss, which is negative, by one object is equal to the heat gained by another. That's if this is really showing the law of conservation of energy, how energy loss must be gained by another object. So let's go ahead and look at this um, this model right here on this side. If you look at this closely, you'll see a hot metal. The hot metal is probably going is being submerged into a cooler medium called water. And so you'll notice that heat lost by that metal, because the metal is warmer, while the water, the medium, is cooler, you'll notice that heat is going to flow from the warmer to the cooler. So heat's going to always go from warmer to cooler object until they reach what is called an equilibrium. So this equation right here, the way we make our statement is the heat loss by the metal is gained by the water. Loss being negative, gained by the water is positive. So technically, we should have a negative in front of this side right here. So when we substitute all the pieces of this equation, the mass of the metal, the specific heat capacity of the metal, and the change in temperature of the metal, and then the mass of the water, heat capacity, of, or, uh, specific heat of the water, and the change in temperature of the water, we then can calculate. So let's start a heat flow problem. So in, in any heat flow problem where we, you're f seeing heat flow from one object, like a piece of silver, to another object like water here, you have to write what is called a heat flow statement. And the heat flow statement goes like this. The heat that's lost by silver, and silver's AG, is going to be gained, Q gained, by water. So a heat flow statement really helps us to kind of focus where the loss is and where the gain is. And where it's lost, you will put a negative value. Where it's gained, you will put a positive value to the Q. And we know what Q is. As long as no phase change has occurred, we're looking at Q being MCAT. Um, so the MCAT of the silver equals the MCAT of the water. So we're going to substitute MCAT in, knowing what the pieces are. So here's our M of our silver. Here is our temperature. This is our T initial. So this is our T initial of our silver. It's dropped into 30 milliliters, which is really 30 grams. So this is our mass of our water. And then here's our T initial of our water, and then this is our final temperature of our water. So the temperature of the water and the silver will reach the same temperature in, e in the end. It's called the equilibrium temperature, and that is the final temperature for both the water and the silver.
So let's go ahead and substitute all our values in. MCAT, we're looking at MCAT. So starting off with the mass of the silver, which is our unknown. And don't forget that negative, so I'm going to put that negative in front. So the mass of the silver is not known to us, so we're just going to call it mass of silver times the specific heat capacity of silver. And that is right here. Specific heat capacity of silver is 0.235 joules times grams over degrees Celsius, or joules per gram times degrees Celsius. And then the change in temperature of the silver. So silver starts off at 125.00 degrees Celsius, and then it becomes 23 0.77 degrees Celsius. So we're looking at T final being 23.77 degrees Celsius minusing 125 degrees Celsius. Now uh, we don't have much room so we're going to go to the bottom here and we'll just we're just going to work for what or we're going to work our way through MCAT for water. So plus the mass of the water is 30 grams. The specific heat capacity of water is on that chart, specific heat table, which is 4.184 joules per gram times degrees Celsius. And the change in temperature is T final, which is 23.77 degrees Celsius minus its initial temperature, which was 20 degrees Celsius, which is the water's initial temperature. So now all it is is a lot of math. So you want to make sure your algebra is up to par and you want to just do the math accordingly. I get, I find out that this part right here, this part right here is going to be a negative term. When you take a smaller number minus a bigger number, you will get a negative term. That negative, when multiplied times this negative, is going to end up with a positive value. And so my next, um, when I do my math, my algebra, I end up with this equation. So if you don't end up with this, you must have done something mathematically wrong, okay? So check your math. I get 23.78905 times the mass of that silver in the end. Equaling on the other side, this is the water side, when I multiply all of these numbers right here, 30 times 4.184 times essentially 3.77 when you sub after you subtract these two values, I get 473.21 0.2104. And of course, dividing both sides by 23.78905 to try to isolate the mass by that variable by itself. In other words, to solve for the mass of silver, I get 19. 0.89 grams, which is the answer here. Now I would pause and try to work through the next problem on your own. So in number two, example number two, you're looking at 80 grams of silver is heated by adding 25 grams of silver, or hot gold at 131.00 degrees Celsius. The initial temperature of the water was 22.2. What was the final equilibrium temperature? So you're looking for the equilibrium temperature between both water and gold, which is their, both their final temperatures in essence. So again, write a heat flow statement. The heat lost by gold, gold is AU, is going to be gained by water. And water is such a reliable medium. Not only is it a liquid that we can put a solid in, 
but it also has high specific heat capacity. And so it absorbs a lot of heat before it changes its temperature by one degree Celsius. So MCAT on each side is what we're looking at. No phase change is occurring, so we're just going to do MCAT on both sides. Mass of silver, or sorry, of gold, is 25 grams. The specific heat capacity is down here for, for gold, and it looks like on that table we see it to be 0.129. I put the units in so you, that you can actually see how the units end up being whatever the final unit should be, which is degrees Celsius in this case. Um, the temperature change of gold is, well, its final temperature is unknown to us. So I'm going to call it X to make it easier. If I put TF, it might make it a little bit harder for us to solve for, for that TF. So you can put any letter, it's just X is just more defined and we can actually we're so used to seeing X as a variable to solve for. So T, the final temperature of the gold is X. Its initial temperature is 131 degrees Celsius. Now I go over to the water side. This is the MCAT for the water. The mass of the water is 80 grams. The specific heat capacity of water is 4.814 joules per gram times degrees Celsius and the change in temperature. So I'm going to go down here for the change in temper temperature because I'm a little I'm out of room. And so the final temperature is the same equilibrium temperature called X, same X as this side here, so same X. And so now we're going to subtract it from its initial temperature, was which water's initial temperature, which was 22.2 degrees Celsius. And I'm going to put parentheses here because we're multiplying it. Now, multiplying it through, you're going to have to do algebra very, very, very well here, especially taking note of this negative term or this negative right here, so be very careful as you multiply. You're going to have to use the distributive property to distribute these numbers in. So I'll work out some steps so you can see the math and make sure you do it correctly. Um, the first thing I did was I actually multiplied these terms together. Likewise, I multiply these terms together before I can distribute into each that once I multiply, I then can distribute into each of these terms in this parentheses. So multiplying those two numbers together, and I'm going to get rid of all the units because that can cause a little bit of a headache as I do my calculations. So this is what I get upon multiplying my um, 25 grams times 0.128. So I get 3.225. So I'll make that a little clearer for us to see. Negative 3.225. And then of course I'm multiplying times x minus 131.00. And let's go to the other side. In multiplying these two terms right here, the 80 times 4.184, I get 334.72. And of course, the rest of the term goes right over here, which is x minus 22.2 degrees Celsius. Oh, I'm not going to put the units there. So from this step, what you have to do is called the distributive property. So I'm going to distribute the, th the negative 3.225 into each of these terms here. Likewise, over to this side, I'm going to distribute into each of these terms right here. Upon doing that, I get negative 3.225 
I get negative 3.225x, and then that negative multiplied to a negative value, which is negative 131, gives me a positive value. And so I end up adding to 422.475. And then I go over to the other side, and likewise I did distribute. So distributing 334.72 into the terms inside, I get this first term, and then I multiply and I get minus 7430784. Um, you have to move all the x's to one side and then you move all the other numbers to the opposite. So I am going to move my x's, this x here, so I'm going to add 3.225x over to this side. And then I'm going to move 7,430 to the opposite side. Upon moving those terms to their corresponding side, I actually get zero here and I also get zero here, leaving me with 7,853.259 on one side, and then on the opposite side, I get 337.945 times x on the opposite side. And as our math algebra tells us, in order for us to isolate x by itself, we have to divide that away and out of the way. And so x ends up being 23.5. And that is our final equilibrium temperature in the end. Here we're looking at mixed problems with phase changes and no phase changes. So this is like a multi, this is a multi-step problem. Um, here you have the heat curve of water and how we know this is the heat curve of water is because of the phase changes. You see at 0 degrees Celsius you'll notice a phase change. At 100 degrees Celsius you'll notice another phase change. So this is in fact water's heat curve. Now as you explore water's heat curve, um, we are looking at different uh, phases of water as well as their phase changes. So reading the problem as we read it from the top, it says calculate the amount of heat required to heat 100 grams of ice at a negative 10 degrees Celsius and ice is a solid, water is a solid at negative 10 degrees Celsius to steam at 105 degrees Celsius. So let's go ahead and answer the top two questions which is which equation are we looking at to use and then the second question is which segment we are going to um, be calculating, okay? So I'm going to answer the second question first, which is which segment? So you're looking at going from negative, negative um, 10 degrees Celsius all the way to 105 degrees Celsius. So that's approximately those two spots right there. And because of that, you're looking at multiple segments that you have to um, incorporate and sum together in the end. So let's start off with the first segment that we're looking at. And it looks like we're looking at segment AB. And then we're going to go into segment BC, which is a phase change, where ice is going to melt. And then we're going to go into CD, as well as DE. So CD is when you're purely liquid water. DE is when you've gone through, you're going through a phase change where water is becoming a gas. 
vaporization, and then of course EF, parts of EF, that is. So with all those segments, you're going to calculate the heat for each part of those segments, and you're going to use several, many equations actually for each of the segments. So let's talk about the equations you, you'd have to use. Now when you're engaging in a phase change, you're using the M delta H fusion equation. Again, Q equals M delta H vaporization here. So you're looking at the phase change equation. And then when you're not, you're actually just using Q equals M cat. And of course, the specific heat capacity will be different for each of the portions of the MCAT. And right here, we're also using Q equals MCAT. So hopefully you have all your data um, in front of you so that you can start putting in your constants, like your specific heat capacity, as well as your, your enthalpy of fusion or vaporization. So the equations you're going to be using is either Q equals M delta H fusion or vaporization and the other equation is Q equals M cat and of course your specific heat capacity will vary depending on what substance you're looking at. So I have to break this problem up into the multi-step. So we're starting off at AB, which is the heat involved along AB, as so water as ice. And as we do that, we're going to break up, this is how we break it up into segments. I kind of like to organize myself with saying, okay, this is segment, the heat involved in segment AB. And that heat is going to be MCAT. So the mass of water or ice is 100 grams and the specific heat capacity of ice is 2.03 joules per gram times degrees Celsius. And now the change in temperature is from here to here, which is negative 10 degrees to zero, which is 10 degrees Celsius. So you put 10 degrees Celsius for your change in temperature with a 10 dot degrees Celsius okay now we go to the next Q the Q the next Q is along BC and if you look at the graph you can follow along and see that that's a phase change you're going through a phase change water is, or ice is going through a phase change during that time and so you're going to use the M times Delta H of fusion so M is a hundred grams and delta H of fusion is in fact 334 joules per gram. And then we go to the next segment. The next segment is segment CD, which is liquid water. And so I'm going to use my MCAT equation. And I know my specific heat capacity is 4.184 joules per gram times degrees Celsius. And the change in temperature during that time, it, or during that part, is 100 degrees Celsius. And then I go to the next segment. The next segment is DE. My segment DE, if you look at my heat curve, is a phase change. So I am going to use M, which is my mass, times my delta enthalpy of vaporization and that's 2,260 joules per gram. Now my last segment. My last segment is Q of EF and that is this very last segment right here from 0 to 105 degrees Celsius. So I'm going to go ahead and use my MCAT equation and the specific heat capacity of steam is 2.01. And you can get your specific heat capacity on the table on the other pages um, where you, when we first introduce specific heat capacity.
and the change in temperature is 5 degrees Celsius. And so let's go ahead and calculate each part of these segments and then just add them all up together. So when you add them all up together, so when you add Q of AB plus Q of BC plus Q of CD plus Q of DE and Q of EF, you get 304,000 joules in the end. Now the bottom asks you to basically calc or, um, graph this heat curve based on that data right there. So you kind of have to, you do have to go through each of the points of calculation. When I calculate Q of AB, I get 2,030. And then Q of BC is 33,400. Q of CD is 41,840. Q of C or DE is 226,000. And that's the most energy right there. And then the last one, Q of EF, is 1,005. And with all those values, I'm just going to approximate on my graph all of those points. And knowing that it all adds up to 300,000, I usually start off with just that. And from there, I break it in, into three parts, 100,000 and 200,000. Again, approximating. And this is all in joules. And from the 100, I think of 50,000. So this, this is how I usually break up my graph. And this is 150,000 and 250,000 there. And again, from there, I just approximate. So below 0 is right here, I'm assuming. So negative 10 degrees Celsius is right here. And so the amount of energy is about 2,000, which really is hardly much along this line. And then you'll see a phase change occur. And the phase change is another 33,000, which is still under 50. So you're still under 50 right here. And then you move for another 51, or 41,000, which is a quite a bit of energy here. So we're at, let's see, about 75,000 at this point. So I'm going to approximate where 75 is, which is the middle of the road here, until I hit to 100. So this is my 75 stretch here. And then a phase change occurs, and this is the longest phase change, and that's 226,000 joules of energy. So I'm at um, approximately 300,000 at this point, a little under 300,000. Oh, no, over, sorry. Um, I'm, at, I'm over 100,000, so this is the longest stretch here. Vaporization is a very long stretch. And then from there, it's just a little stretch beyond the 100. So this is where 105 degrees Celsius is along this line right here. So there you go. Those are your segments for your graph. And notice how much heat is involved right around here, which is the vaporization. It is the most energy um, requiring step right there. I'd like you to pause the video and fill in the empty blanks and then read this section once, twice, and three times as this will kind of this will lead into what we're about to get into with Gibbs free energy change in enthalpy as well as change in enthalpy or entropy okay 
So after you've read it once, twice, and three times, I do want to point some things out. This little degree symbol actually means a set of conditions. It's actually standard ambient conditions. And when it comes to thermochemistry, standard ambient conditions would be room temperature, which is 25 degrees Celsius, and one atmosphere pressure. So these are your standard conditions. Unlike gases, which is at zero degrees Celsius, thermochemistry, in thermochemistry, we're looking at room temperature, which is 25 degrees Celsius. So these, this little degree symbol represents that. Gibbs free energy is a measurement of basically the available energy to do work and it tells us whether the reaction is spontaneous and it measures whether um, it will con con occur without a continuous source of energy needed, whether a reaction can basically do work. Enthalpy, change in enthalpy is a measurement of heat content and we've already discussed this, uh, how chemical reactions have bonds and those substances in those chemical reactions, those bonds have energy involved in them, in them and that's why we can calculate the enthalpy using average bond tables. Um, and then the last one which is the entropy. Now notice the unit for entropy is a little different here. This is the change in entropy and entropy measures disorder. Nature's fa nature favors disorder, so entropy of the universe is always increasing. And when you think of entropy, you're always thinking out of things that have more particles has more entropy than things that have less particles. Um, solids, liquids, solids have less entropy than liquids, which have less than gases. Pure substances have less entropy than mixtures of different substances called solutions. So this is a basic little overview of entropy as well as enthalpy as well as Gibbs free energy. Moving on to the next page. Now with delta G, when delta G is negative, which is less than zero, you're going to see that the reaction is spontaneous. That defines spontaneity. And then when delta G is zero, that means you're at chemical equilibrium. This is an equilibrium symbol. When delta G is greater than zero, the reaction is non-spontaneous. So let me write that out. Um, that symbol might not be familiar with you, but this means equilibrium. All right. We also already have learned this when enthalpy, change in enthalpy is less than zero, which is negative, you're, you're dealing with an exothermic reaction. When enthalpy is positive, it's endothermic. This is a little bit of an editing, yours is already edited. Um, when the change in entropy is greater than zero, that means there's more disorder. And when the change in enthalpy or entropy is less than zero, then that means the reaction has less disorder. Okay, so with that information let's go ahead and look at the link between or among the three variables. This is the equation that links entropy, enthalpy, as well as Gibbs free energy which is spontaneity. Now there's also T. T is involved in this equation so you want to multiply T times your or T which is in Kelvin temperature and multiply it times your entropy. Now entropy units are usually in joules per mole degree times degrees Kelvin, so you want to make sure you convert your consistent units among entropy, enthalpy, and Gibbs free energy. So I would highly recommend leaving your units always in kilojoules as far as the joule unit is concerned so that if you have kilojoules per mole all across the board, especially when you multiply your entropy times your temperature Kelvin in Kelvin, you'll have consistent units. So let's go ahead and look at each problem and see if we could apply delta G, delta H, as well as delta S, okay? In the first example problem, you're looking at in the equilibrium of liquid water becoming water vapor what is its boiling point in degrees Celsius if the following values are for delta H and delta S? So we plug it into your equation 
that links all three of them together, but here you're solving for delta or temperature, which is, um, it's going to be in Kelvin, but then you're going to convert it to Celsius. So let's plug all those variables in, starting off with delta G. Since it's at um, an equilibrium point, we know that delta G equals zero when this is happening. So I'm going to plug in zero for delta G. Delta H is 40.65 minus temperature, which is what we're solving for, times it by delta S. And notice delta S is in joules. And because delta S is in joules, as you see right here, delta K, uh, H, which is enthalpy, is in kilojoules. You want those two units to be consistent. So I'm actually going to convert my delta S, my entropy, into kilojoules. And so I'm going to move it over three spaces. And so when I solve for my T, I end up with 373 Kelvin, but I want it in Celsius. So I subtract 273 from that and I get 100 degrees Celsius. And that makes sense. Boiling occurs at 100 degrees Celsius for water. So this is the boiling temperature, boiling point of water. Let's move over to enthalpy change in enthalpy. It says explain why the change in enthalpy for the vaporization of liquid water to steam aligns with a positive 40.65 kilojoules per mole. And it aligns because this reaction, or when you convert liquid water to steam, water vapor, you are seeing um, vaporization occurring and because vaporization is requires energy to occur so it absorbs energy we say that that absorption means that the reaction is endothermic which means the, delta, the change in enthalpy is positive. And that's the case. With a positive 40.65 kilojoules per mole. Let's go over to this side, or entropy. Would the temperature in the equation above be recorded as Celsius or Kelvin? Entropy is in units of joules per mole times Kelvin. You know that you want your um, units of temperature to be in Kelvin units. And so we circle Kelvin as our choice of temperature units. Now we go into the problem itself. Explain why the change in enthalpy for the same vaporization reaction aligns with a delta S that is positive 109 or joules per mole times Kelvin. And so now we um, figure out that because you're leaving, you start off in the reactants with one mole of liquid, and that one mole of liquid becomes one mole of gas. That means entropy is increasing. The disorder is increasing. So that's why a delta S that is greater than zero makes sense because there's more disorder as you go from a liquid to a gas. All right, so let's go down to the chart below and let's look at it conceptually. We're really seeing how enthalpy, entropy, and temperature gives us Gibbs free energy conceptually, sign-wise. So if you have a, a an exothermic reaction with a lot of disorder, how you look at this is dependent on low temperature and high temperature. So if I've got a negative 
sorry, let's make it red, negative delta S and a positive, or a negative delta H and a positive delta S, you know that a negative minusing a positive is going to give you an overall negative value. So this has to be a negative delta G, gives free energy. So let's go to the next one. Whether it's high or low temperature, it's going to be the same scenario. So now the same thing goes here when, when your delta S is positive and your delta H is negative. So high disorder and an exothermic reaction. When you subtract those two terms, you'll get a negative delta H or delta G, regardless of high or low temperature. Now we look at the next scenario. In the next scenario, you're looking at an endothermic reaction with um, less disorder, so it's becoming more orderly if you want to look at it that way. I kind of like to keep it with the word disorder, so less disorder. So at high temperature or low temperature, you're going to see that this term right here, when you subtract a negative of a negative, it becomes a positive. So you're going to see this become a positive term in the end, likewise over here. And so it's the delta G is going to vary depending on the actual temperature. So if we're dealing with low temperature, so T is low, low T, that means the term right here between T and delta S is going to be a very low term. Um, and so you're seeing that a low term plus another positive low term is going to give you a positive value in the end. Likewise over here, or in the same manner, if you've got a, um, a high value here for the, the T delta S, you're going to see it's going to be a positive, high positive plus a positive gives you a positive value in the end. Now we go to the next one where we're dealing with a positive endothermic reaction for both scenarios and then a very um, highly disordered reaction. So when you subtract this term T delta S, you're going to still see a negative, this term is going to be a negative value that you're adding. So subtraction is like addition but the opposite of that. So and the same thing go, goes down here, but let's focus on this one first. When you subtract this term, depending on what T is, that will de determine whether your G is going to be positive or negative. So if your T is low, that means it's probably going to be a positive delta G in the end. But if your T is a high value, so if this T is a high value T, I am going to see a term between T times delta S to be a very high negative value. Because it's a high negative value, I'm going to find it to be a negative value in the end. So this is low and this is high. Now let's see what happens when we're dealing with an exothermic reaction with less disorder. So once again, I like to look at it as a, ne when I look at the negative, the subtraction, I think of this as a positive, same here. And so if the temperature is um, low, so you have a low temperature, this term right here is going to be a low term. And that low positive term is going to be um, neutralized by a, a larger negative, so there's going to be more negatives than positives. Um, over here, same thing. Here you have a, or not same, similar, but if you have temperature being high, so this is a high temperature, you're seeing that your term here is going to be, your T times delta S term is going to be a very high positive value compared to the negative, the other, neg the negative term for delta H. And so your value in the end is going to be a um, positive, a positive delta G.
So this really explains all the different all the different delta G values in the end that you see right here. Okay. Let's look at some example problems. Um, does the entropy, number one, does the entropy of the system increase or decrease for the following changes that you see there? So let's go ahead and look at the following changes. Water is boiled. So when water is boiling, you're looking at H2O from a liquid to H2O gas. So it looks like a mole of liquid water is becoming a mole of steam. And that looks like entropy is in fact increasing, which means your delta S is going to be greater than zero. Here you in B, letter B, you have one mole of solid calcium carbonate becoming a mole of solid calcium oxide and a mole of carbon dioxide gas. So it looks like the entropy is also increasing because one solid, one mole of solid is becoming um, a mole of solid plus a mole of gas. In the next example, in the third example, you're seeing that four moles of gases, and hopefully you can see the four moles of gases, one plus three gives you four moles of gases in the reactants, becomes two moles of gases in the product. And because of that, that means entropy is decreasing, so entropy is going to be less than zero in this case. Now we go down to the next set of problems. In 2A, here we have a reaction that looks like it's a decomposition reaction. So in decomposition reactions, we see one thing becoming several parts in the product. And because of that, you're going to need overall some energy in that reaction. So we can predict from this that the reaction is in fact endothermic. And from um, the reaction itself, we see one solid in the reactants becoming two gases. And because you're seeing one solid become two gases, the entropy is also increasing. And with that equation, which is the equation of delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, if your enthalpy is negative or positive and your entropy is also positive, your T is going to determine whether this value, these two terms when you subtract them from each other, will be a positive or negative. In other words, your delta G will vary depending on the temperature. And so spontaneity, we can't say it will vary also depending on the temperature. In the next problem, in B, you actually can substitute values into the equation because you're given both the enthalpy and the entropy. So substituting it into the equation, and I'll do it on the bottom right here, so we, because we have room, so B. In substituting that equation, delta G equals enthalpy, which is negative 572 kilojoules per mole, per mole, minus temperature, which we said was standard conditions, which is 25 degrees Celsius. In Kelvin, that's 290. 8 Kelvin, and then we multiply it times your delta S. Now if you notice very carefully, delta S is in joules, delta H is in kilojoules. You want those consistent units. And the best thing to do is convert the joules to kilojoules. So move it over three spaces over, gives us point negative 0.326. So with those values and their and them being calculated, and I kind I do like to just know that subtraction is like taking the addition of the opposite. And so doing the math, I get in the end delta G 
equaling negative 475 kilojoules per mole. And because it's negative 475 kilojoules per mole, I know that this reaction is spontaneous because it's less than zero. Now we go to the next one. In the next one, this is conceptual because we're not given actual delta S or delta G H values, so we're going to conceptually walk through this. Um, it looks like it's a combustion reaction, and we've always learned that combustion reactions are exothermic. And if you look at the entropy, you see that a liquid, pentane, plus eight oxygen molecules, so eight moles of gases, forms a total of 11 moles of gases, and so it looks like the entropy is increasing, and so it's positive. Now, once again, you kind of go through the logic of it all. If I've got a negative, negative delta H, a positive delta S, I know with a negative and a positive here, I know for sure I'm going to have a negative value overall. So this is going to be negative delta G. And because it's a negative, I'm going to put the word negative also, the reaction is considered spontaneous. In the, in the last one, letter D, it is a calculation one because you're given the enthalpy and the entropy. So you're just going to calculate your delta G, your Gibbs free energy. So once again, it's just substituting values in. Oops, this is positive, positive 58.0 kilojoules per mole, minus 298 times a by. Once again, I've got to make sure I remember to plug in my entropy in joule or kilojoules. And so I multiply all my values and I get in the end positive 5.3 kilojoules per mole. And with that, I'm going to put it in here, positive 5.3. That means my reaction is, in fact, non-spontaneous. And that it ends our lecture.